Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for the in kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for the very kind invitation with a very tough title. Are we ready for PGT uh, for unemployees? And then I will try to see whether we are ready or not, or maybe. So first of all, the definition. Pre-implantation genetic testing, this is according to the last uh, uh, glossary of WHO um, that is going to be published in 2016. Uh, Pre-implantation genetic testing is a test which is performed to analyze the DNA from all sites, polar bodies, embryos, cleavage state, or blastocyst for HLA typing or for determining genetic abnormalities. And there are three different types of PGT. PGT for monogenic single gene defeat, PGT-M, PGT for chromosomal structural rearrangements, PGT-SR, and PGT for aneuploidies, PGT-A, and then I'm going to talk about PGT-A today. So PGT, as uh, WHO says, is a test. And like any test, has its limitation. And uh, the diagnosis does not imply certainty, first of all, but carries an implicit probability. The value of a test for predicting a condition depends on pre-test probability and post-test performance. So this is the likelihood ratio, or if we want, the sensibility and specificity. So let's take a test that has been used since 40 years, that is the prenatal diagnosis. As uh, the, the chromosomal risk has a prevalence of 0.1 to 4%, the abortion risk, the invasiveness, is 0.21%. No results is about 1%. The accuracy is about 99%. So one of the most debated issue is, if any, which indication for pre-implantation genetic testing? Could be advanced maternal age, could be female infertility, severe male factor infertility, repeated implantation failure, repeated miscarriage, monogenic diseases only, or single embryo transfer, so used to select the single embryo transfer. And uh, it's so debated that if we look at one very recent publication where there was uh, uh, interviewed some expert gynecologists, embryologists, or, or uh, uh, molecular biologists, and uh, with regard to the, the, to, the, uh, to the indication, then you can see that uh, there were some gynecologists that found uh, all these indications that would be suitable for pre-implantation genetic testing. Some others, none of these indications. And amongst the most indications selected by these uh, uh, experts, there was the advanced maternal age, repeated implantation failure, repeated miscarriage, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and a single embryo transfer. So if we, if we have to try to answer to this question, are we ready for BGT? And why should we use BGT? Then we should first answer to these three questions. Does it improve the efficacy? Does it worsen the efficacy? Does it improve the efficiency? Does it improve the efficacy of IVF? So to improve the efficacy we have, means that we have to increase the number of babies born per starter cycle. And this is easy. It doesn't. So PGT cannot fix the aneuploidies. And if we want to improve the efficacy in IVF, then we have to optimize the number of outside retrieved. Then we have to optimize the IVF lab and the technology. Then we have to optimize the crowd preservation program. Does it worsen, the second question, the efficacy of IVF? Very likely no. We cannot answer no because we need a prospective randomized multicenter study to assess the community birth rate per intention to treat. So we have to know whether we lose the embryos. What is the evidence today? There's a prospective randomized trial addressing the community birth rate per intention to treat of PGT versus standard and untested IVF. 
which is submitted to, uh, for publication and is actually at the second round of revision, that shows no differences. But we have to wait more information. So we address this issue, but unfortunately in a retrospective study. And the retrospective study has uh, its limits uh, and, uh, uh, and value um, for, for this. So we analyzed an advanced maternal age patients. Uh, we compared pre-implantation genetic testing versus untested IVF cycles. And then you can see that the mean age was 39.5, 39.6. The mean number of transfer cycles per OSI retrieval was 1.2 in untested and was 0.5 in tested. The number of embryo transfer was 2.4 untested and 0.5 for patients. And when we look at the cumulative uh, 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 delivery rate per all side retrieval, then we, we were not able to see any differences, 21% versus 24%. Then in 2015, there have been published two, uh, one systematic review of randomized control trials and one meta-analysis. And uh, in younger patients, the implantation rate per transfer were significantly higher, and also in older patients. With regard to the meta-analysis of three randomized control trials and eight cohort studies, then the, with regard to the randomized control trials, the clinical implantation rate was significantly higher, the sustained implantation rate was significantly higher with uh, pre-implantation giant testing, and uh, also with regard to the observational study. But we, we still have a problem. And the problem is the false negative and the false positive results that we can have. And to better address this issue, we should use prospective, blind, non-selection study. So it means that we should uh, make a blastocyst, take the biopsy, then transfer the blastocyst blindly, and then analyze afterwards the, the results of the blastocyst. So what about the false negative? The false negative is an embryos that are diagnosed as euploid that resulted in an affected fetus child. Here we have a paper published, 2014, and then you can see that uh, on uh, uh, almost 5,000 embryos diagnosed as euploid, then the total errors, total errors, errors that have been found in the miscarriage and in the ongoing pregnancy was 0 0.2, so it means one out of 400. And the errors found on the ongoing pregnancies was 0 0.1, one out of 900. And if we look at the per transfer, 3,100 uh, uh, transfers made, then the error per transfer, the total errors per transfers was one out of 300 and per ongoing pregnancy was one out of 700. So these are our results, 1,350 embryos, 1,338 transfers, 100 miscarriages. Most of these miscarriages, I have to say, that we could not have any uh, um, karyotyping results, but in those that we have, it was concordance. Uh, six, uh, uh, 602 ongoing deliveries, 45%. 606 ongoing implantation, uh, 45%. One error found in prenatal diagnosis, it was a 47XXX. So with a clinically recognizable false negative error of 0.07% per transfer and 0.1% per ongoing gestational uh, uh, sub. Then there are also the false false negative. So this is a case report that we published together with uh, uh, Professor Levisetti that was a patient, uh, repeated, a repeated miscarried patient that did uh, uh, in, um, in uh, the, the center where Pablo is, uh, is chair. Uh, uh, they did a PGT. So they tra she transferred one euploid embryo. Then she got pregnant, she miscarried, and the uh, karyotype of uh, the miscarriage was uh, Turner. So then we went with the uh, DNA fingerprinting, and then we found that the embryo that uh, we transferred was not that the embryo that implanted. So the embryo that implanted 
was uh, brother of the embryo that we transferred, but not was the same embryo. So what's happened? This was uh, replacement was done with a natural cycle, and the patient got pregnant, and then uh, she, and then she had a uh, Turner syndrome. What about the false positive? The false positive are those embryos that uh, are diagnosed as uh, um, aneuploid, but that, if transferred, can sustain implantation. Uh, here we have two studies, one in 2012 and one in 2015, with two different platforms. SNP array, 99 embryos assigned as aneuploid, transferred, and 4%, 4 sustained implantation. Another one with NGS, 41 embryos assigned as aneuploid, and zero sustained implantation. So the positive predictive value, the euploid embryos resulting in sustained implantation, euploid, the diagnosed euploid, is almost 60%, according to these two studies. And the negative predictive value, embryos that you said that were um, aneuploid, that sustained implantation, was about 3%. Then we have the uh, paper by, uh, published on N uh, New England Journal by Hermano Grego and co-workers that uh, clearly showed that uh, uh, an embryo that is assigned as mosaic can sustain implantation. Here we have 3,800 biops blastocysts. The method was the RACE-EGH, and 181 mosaic blastocysts, so 4.8% 4 4 4 4 of mosaic blastocysts. They transferred 18, and they had six deliveries. Uh, as I said before, any platform, any test has its uh, capabilities and limits. So this is a study that we published in 2014. We took uh, 120 erase GH aneuploid blastocysts. We rebiopsed and we analyzed with QPCR. And then we found the same diagnosis in 81.7%. Then we found different diagnosis in 18%. These were rebiopsed again and uh, analyzed with SNP array. Then four with no matches by all the three methods. Very like these, it were mosaics. Ten were SNP and QPCR matching, and four were SNP and RACGI matching. So in one, the QPCR was uh, uh, error. And in the other one, the RACGH was error. So it can be possible that uh, amongst the biopsies that made a diagnosis of uh, uh, um, mosaicism, there could be a limit of, of the platform. On the other hand, in uh, this paper by Jamie Griffo and Santi Munne and Dagan Wells, so they made a comparison between uh, NGS, a validation of uh, NGS with a ray CGH. And then they found, they analyzed 60 embryos diagnosed with NGS, 20 euploid, 20 aneuploid, and 20 mosaics. And then they were reanalyzed with, uh, 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 with uh, ray CGH. And then they found 100% concordance uh, with euploid, 100% concordance with aneuploid, and with regard to the mosaic, they found 16 of these 20 were diagnosed as euploid and four as abnormal. For the sake of clarity, I have to show that has been published also another paper that shows uh, six ongoing deliveries from uh, embryos that were diagnosed as uh, uh, altered, uh, aneuploid, in uh, normal ongoing or normal birth. But this was a center that has never implemented a PGT program that uh, makes service. No report on amplification rate, neither on any parameters of the quality of their analysis, no description of the methods, nor embryological, nor molecular. So this is a recent paper, opinion paper, that we published in Human Reproduction, uh, where we analyzed the papers published that compared the inner cell mass with the uh, trophoblast cells. 
And we found that the discrepancy between the innocent mass and the, and the trophy ectoderm cells is about 6%. This is a more recent paper, is uh, 2017, uh, where a gro group of uh, Chinese people then they did this exactly the same study. Inner cell mass analysis, and then three different spots of the trophoectoderm. And then excluding the partial haploidies, then the, co con the concordance between all blastocyst sections, it was 96%. This paper is 2000 and, uh, uh, 2016, Santi Munet, James Griffo, and Dagan Wells. They found that with the HR, high resolution NGS, the mosaic aneuploid euploid was between 10% and 26%. But the same authors found that after having diagnosed a mosaic embryo with NGS, then they disaggregated the blastocyst, so they took different spots of the blastocyst, and then they found that in these disaggregated uh, spots of the blastocyst, they could confirm the mosaicism in 50% of the embryos diagnosed with NGS with mosaicism. And the other 50% were euploid or aneuploid. So we have indeed a problem. And maybe we require more extensive validation before the diagnosis of mosaicins could be introduced in our daily clinical practice. There are two issues mainly, the technical and biological issues that still need to be properly addressed to provide a fair counseling of the couples. And if we have the only embryo that can be transferred that is mosaic, then we must give, offer to the patients an extensive gen genetic counseling to discuss the potential risk in terms of miscarriage and with respect to the implant on the health and newborn. So the last question, does PGT improve the efficiency of the treatment? And to increase the efficiency, it means that we have to decrease the negative events. And the negative events are multiple pregnancies, abortions, unemployed pregnancies, decrease the time to pregnancy and probability of dropout. And the answer is yes. So multiple pregnancy. We know that multiple pregnancy is one of the most important complications in IVF. Uh, you know better than I do for sure that with twin pregnancies, we have all these phenomenon during the pregnancy of the woman. Risk for the patients and risk for the babies. This is a prospective randomized trial comparing the transfer of one tested blastocyst versus two untested blastocysts. And then you can see that the clinical pregnancy rate was absolutely identical. But when we look at the multiple pregnancies, then when we look at the multiple pregnancies, then there's a single thrown pregnancy, 100% uh, in tested blastocyst and 50% on in untested uh, blastocyst. And if we look at the uh, obstetrical outcome, then of course, the differences between the pregnancy obtained with uh, tested blastocysts versus untested blastocysts were completely different. The other issue is the miscarriage rate according to the age of the woman. So these are the data, the pregnancy rate after IVF in Italy in 2014 from the National Italian Registry from the National Health Institute. And then we can see how, of course, the pregnancy rate uh, decreases with increase of the age. But if we look at the miscarriage rate, the miscarriage rate dramatically increase with the increase of, uh, the, of the age of the woman. Again, this, is a retros this was a retrospective study, but in a retrospective analysis, then we can see that the number of miscarriages significantly is reduced in uh, uh, PGT uh, cycles versus non-tested cycle. Does it reduce the time to pregnancy? We have always more patients that approach to uh, IVF treatments that are older and older. So the time to pregnancy, it starts to begin a very important issue. So there's no studies addressing the time to pregnancy comparing uh, PGT versus untested. But there's this uh, study, very recent study, 
that compares the transfer of a single blastocyst versus the transfer of a single um, cleavage state embryo. And uh, you can see that the cumulative live birth rate is absolutely identical, but the time to pregnancy is significantly uh, improved, shortened with the transfer of the blastocyst. So if the blastocyst is a sort of physiological selection of the embryos, I should imagine that if we go further for selection, then we should even more shorten the time to pregnancy. So in conclusion, PGTA probably has the same efficacy, but we have to wait. But increase the efficiency of uh, uh, the, uh, our IVF treatment. So we have a standard care and we have a, a PGS. 60%, and this is the rate of uh, mean age patients of 38, 39, 60% are the aneuploid embryos. So if we skip this, we will have 40%. Then we will have the same live births. We cannot fix the embryos. Then we have a significant reduction of the miscarriages. Then we have a significant reduced number of the uh, transfers that has uh, performed. So lower abortion rate, lower abnormal pregnancies, less time to pregnancy, single embryo transfer, and reduce multiple pregnancies. But before saying, are we ready for PGDA, we have to wait for more answers that derive from following studies that are ongoing. I thank you for your attention.